This is Steffi and welcome to The Financial Fox. Today I'm sharing a panel discussion with two experts to discuss the intersection of telecommunication innovation and new technologies such as 5G, IoT, blockchain and now AI. So we are looking at the telecommunication industry. We are reimagining the telecommunication industry with all these Web3 technologies. It's a really good discussion, so stay tuned. But before, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. So my guests are David Palmer, visionary and global platform innovator at Vodafone. He basically lead all the blockchain effort and is also co-founder of Vodafone blockchain-based platform digital asset broker. And my other guest is Mark Bistriansky, CEO of EMG and MLD Group. Okay, right. Great to have you on the show, David and Mark. Welcome to the Financial Fox. All right, nice to be on here. Yeah, fantastic. So shall we maybe start with a round of introductions so then, uh, you know, people know what you are, what you're focused on? Sure. So I'll go first, if that's okay, David. So I'm, I'm Mark Bistriansky. I'm the founder and CEO of MLD Group. And we're a telecom specialized uh, for many years, software service provider for the e-commerce CRM uh, domain. And um, yeah, that's what we do. Uh, hi, I'm David Palmer. I'm, um, I've been helping Vodafone to explore blockchain and Web3 technologies for the last four years. Um, as a result of that, I'm now a uh, co-founder of a new uh, platform in Vodafone called the Digital Asset Broker, uh, which is looking at um, using Web3 uh, identity and uh, wallet and transactions capabilities to allow devices to automatically transact. Um, so really, really pleased to be having this uh, discussion uh, today, Stephanie, with you and Mark. Wow, this is, uh, yeah, that's an interesting move and interesting innovation of Vodafone. So let's maybe start with, um, you know, the world telecommunication. Mark, we were having a chat before yes. the interview saying how telecommunication actually is a really old world because uh, what the telco industry refers to is really a global communication infrastructure. And nowadays, new technology are really shaping this industry. So if we are thinking about 5G, we are thinking about Internet of Things, blockchain, now AI. So you are both driving innovation in the space. And I would like to maybe start uh, um, discussing if really is uh, still good to, to use the word telecommunication and then we can perhaps go a little bit deeper in what those uh, new technology are actually bringing to an industry that is, uh, you know, is going to be really disrupted. Yeah. yeah, it's funny actually say that because I was in uh, Paris Blockchain Week and I had a speech there and um, our intro was uh, two telecom uh, real world dinosaurs. Or something like that. So <laughs> I was uh, yeah quite pleased with that. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, it's a it's a old school. It's it's very uh, you know legacy oriented, but then there's amazing things going on with it because, you know, we need the telecommunication industry to, to communicate and um, there needs to be always some, some innovation. It sometimes takes longer than, um, than you'd like to. It's, it's a massive industry, obviously, and they have a lot of legacy uh, systems, applications, uh, providers and so on. So it's not that easy just to make a big switch into something new. But yeah, I do find when, when, there's, a, when there's actually something new uh, that comes out, they, they uh, definitely are very much uh, interested in it uh, but as maybe david can say a bit more how, how things are going with this new uh, blockchain uh, you know amazing space which we're really into as well um i think there's huge opportunity for that uh there's there's uh, th there's a huge opportunity for the you know for uh, as david mentioned there's a you know to to have the uh, these uh, sign on for the, for example for customers to be able to do a sign on instead of having to go to uh, physically into the actual a brick and mortar store and show their ID. And then after five days, they're registered. They can just do it through smart contracts or something like that. And um, there's, there's a lot of innovation there. But um, yeah, we're finding that uh, in, in a, maybe a few years, we will get to where we want. And uh, we're like, you know, really looking forward to working with our telecom customers that we have right now and try to get the, the mass adoption going. So, I think, first of all, yeah, is it 
right to use the word telecommunication. I, I, I think there's still a lot of infrastructure which is based on telecommunication um, and uh, and, and uh, mobility. I mean, the networks are now are now worth a lot. Uh, what I would say um, is that telecommunications companies are moving to become technology companies, right? So um, in Vodafone, we've got a saying which is telco to techco, right? So so everybody's becoming a a, a, a telecommunication company. And uh, also communication service providers are becoming uh, digital service providers. So you're seeing a lot of convergence between uh, communication uh, and platform and customers um, and technology, which is um, blurring the line. So, so what, what I would say is that actually the new definition of a, of a telco is actually a technology company, as it is for, for other, other industries, except telecommunication companies do have some advantages. One of them uh, being uh, the customer basis, so the number of subscribers, uh, both for consumer business and uh, IoT, uh, and also uh, the massive network, um, which um, provides uh, edge-based uh, communications uh, with the phone, uh, which can be leveraged with some of the new uh, communications and technologies like Web3, AI, and, uh, and others. Uh, to form new solutions. So, so I actually believe that, that yes, telcos are evolving to become technology companies and they're also evolving to become platform companies, but uh, they're in a very, we're in, in a very good position to benefit from uh, all of these technologies converging. Well, okay, so there are many technologies converging, but if we just focus on the blockchain aspect, what is the impact that actually blockchain is bringing to the telecommunication industry? No, no, I mean, what, what I'd say straight away is that, uh, you know, blo blockchain, first of all, is something that is for the external automation boundary. Uh, well, what I mean by that is that it's, uh, you know, you have trust within your organization or a certain level of trust within your organization. And blockchain is essentially trust. It's about um, providing, you know, an, an immutable record, a, a ledger of uh, records, the timestamp, uh, you know, the ability to trust data uh, that's written to it. So it provides trust. Now that helps the external automation boundary, i.e. how telcos or other organizations communicate with other people that they don't have contracts and they don't have uh, trust with. Now, in terms of immediate benefits to the telecoms industry, uh, what, you, what you would have seen in some of the headlines is, uh, you know, some of the work that's happening in carrier billing, some of the work, uh, carrier services, and some of the work that's happening uh, in roaming. Uh, which are announced where blockchain is providing a more cost-effective solution uh, for settlement of roaming, right? Uh, providing an immutable ledger, providing smart contracts for automatic uh, settlement. Going forward, however, I think there is an opportunity for uh, the blockchain infrastructure, sorry, for the mobile infrastructure to become part of the blockchain infrastructure. Now, I, I say this to say that uh, um, that uh, Valtteri, Valtteri Buterin uh, who's the founder of, uh, I think, the second biggest public blockchain, uh, Ethereum, uh, was sort of saying, okay, you know, uh, Ethereum is growing. Uh, they recently had something called the, the merge, uh, which moved them from uh, proof of work to proof of stake consensus. What does that mean? It's more any, energy efficient. It provides the basis for more um, volumes of transactions and better security. So, so this is a big move for enterprises to start using public blockchains like Ethereum. What did he say the next step was? Mobile, about having your mobile phone or a mobile device. And for the mobile device uh, to be basically providing consensus uh, for the blockchain. So extending blockchain to mobile. And I think this is a, a, a big potential um, for the convergence of telecoms, um, the telecoms network and blockchain infrastructure. Uh, and uh, and it's one where I think that uh, we're starting even with the base station. Can you can you really run a node with your mobile? Not not at the moment, but there's a lot of uh, work going in that area because um, what, what's happening is that with some of the developments in consensus protocol, so for example, the move for proof of stake, proof of work, and some of the differences, some of the other developments happening in there is that you're getting away from everyone in the, in the network having a full copy of the transaction, right? Full copy of the, of, of the chain to being selected. So you're moving away from full broadcast of channel, uh, in, in technical speak. Now, once you can start, you know, refining that process, yes, absolutely, for not every device, but certainly on some devices, certainly on mobile phones, yes, you could uh, potentially run uh, consensus uh, algorithms, right? And 
uh, when you start looking at that with uh, sort of edge compute, uh, you know, and uh, and confidential compute at the edge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that's something that will happen in the future. Yeah, if I can jump in there, I mean, uh, I'm maybe going to look at a more, more high level and uh, maybe slightly more pessimistic view, but... Uh, uh, you know, for my, uh, I think we've been over uh, in the telecoms over 20 years. And what I found is, you know, there was this big uh, push uh, for uh, doing cloud. For example, you know, we're in the CRM, so we compete against Salesforce. Uh, we can now replace fully Oracle, Siebel, CRM within tel telecom operators. We have many implementations. And I think about already like 12 years ago, we were, we were going to, uh, with my father, to some of our customers and saying, what do you guys think? You know, like, I don't want to name any, whatever, T-Mobile was, whatever. What do you guys think about putting your precious customer data that you have, that you really, you know, <laughs> they need to have on-premises putting into cloud. And that's exactly what they said. They said, well, how could we put our precious customer data in a cloud? That's that's uh, ludicrous, right? So that was that was back then. And now if you go to any telecom, <laughs> they say, you know, are you, are you doing a cloud? Of course we're in a cloud, that's legacy, right? So I, I think that analogy, like uh, with blockchain, I'd really, again, I'm really, I believe in the technology. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm here for. But uh, for, to get that mass adoption, um, there needs to be some some breakthrough, right? There needs to be, like uh, David mentioned, there's a lot of these possibilities for nodes. And yes, I, I do agree that there is this possibility. But again, we need to look at uh, what telecoms are doing. And they're, they're in a big corporations, they're big businesses. And one thing that the decentralized way is, is that maybe it will force them or force them. It'll make uh, some adoption within them as well, too to go that route, but to give, you know, just to give up what they have in a sense and to, to do it in a decentralized way, there needs to be some way to uh, operate in that way. So yes, I do believe that technology is there. I believe uh, it's going to be a bit of a challenge to get the mass adoption. Like for example, is the, is the blockchain now like so safe that, you know, they can put their customer data and their transactions within it? I don't think it's, it's there yet. You know, we, we need to, we need to come up with something which will work for them and be able to, to, you know, provide what we want as well. So. so here it comes down to the debate between a public blockchain and private blockchain. Yes. Either you are, you are developing something with Vodafone that, you know, what I would like to understand is that are you, this, have you decided to go for a public blockchain? If yes, why? And then to the mark point, there is maybe some friction there. You know, like big brands in Web2 who rather prefer a private blockchain over a public blockchain. So, so, so first of all, uh, it depends. Um, so, so, so I think what you have is infrastructure, right? You have blockchain infrastructure, you have uh, telco mobile infrastructure, and I, and I count them all as part of a layer one. And what we're starting to see is this infrastructure at layer one starting to convert the power of 5G with blockchain, the power of, of, of IoT, uh, 5G. Uh, layer one blockchain, uh, all, all of these things coming together to form and, and cloud to form to form infrastructure. Now, now in terms of how telcos use that layer one infrastructure, I think we're part of it, uh, and and the convergence of uh, of, of telco uh, layer one infrastructure with blockchain inf uh, layer one infrastructure, you know, is essential uh, to move things forward. Uh, in terms of the specific question of um, private or permission versus uh, public blockchain. I think that that's being developed from two sides, and, and I'll give you what we're doing afterwards, right? So, so on the one side, you have permission to public. Uh, so this is where uh, organizations are, are starting off with a permission blockchain because of security, because of control, because of ecosystem control points. But you're using, you're developing links between that permission blockchain and public blockchain. So maybe uh, allowing, um, having some, uh, rollout to a public blockchain so you can use, uh, Ethereum smart contract. Um, you know, uh, having, uh, differences, uh, the means for the inter ecosystem to interact. Uh, so that is happening, right? And you'll see a big, a lot of big organizations are running validator nodes for public blockchains. And there is some integration between permission blockchains and private uh, and, and public blockchains. On the other hand, you have a lot of developments on the other side. So that, so what I described before is what you call permission to public. And then you, on the other side, you have public permission. <laughs> and, and this is where uh, some developments in block, block, uh, public blockchains are allowing you to have permissioned areas of it or, or permissioned um, per, per, permission chains within it. And, and both of these things are taking off uh, at the same time. Now, now what we've done uh, is we started out with a permission because we started out four years ago. So we started out with a uh, R3 quarter uh, layer one, but, but we operated layer two. So our approach is to be multi-chain 
Uh, so to be able to use a multiple layer one. Uh, but we started out with, uh, with R3 Corder as a permission. Uh, but now, because we're at layer one, we're starting to work with other protocols. So we're starting to use the permission blockchain as a middleware uh, to interact with public blockchains and run EVM, uh, make, make, make it EVM compatible. Uh, to start to integrate and have ecosystems uh, that are interacting. Do you so, have so a use that, case for those anywhere, uh, David? Or is, is there any, any actually, uh, you know, you mentioned... Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah. What, so are we're you, actually, what are you most being used for, for example? Yeah, so we're, we're actually live uh, with the digital asset broker um, uh-huh. platform. So the, the high-level use case is embedded finance on IoT devices. Uh, why, we're, why we're using blockchain uh, is to provide uh, interoperability of the device identity and also peer-to-peer transactions. Uh, between the devices, you're, you're utilizing wallet, uh, and and why we want to work with uh, uh, public blockchains is two reasons. One is that we're very interested in EVMs and uh, and AVMs, so being able to run different smart contracts. Uh, but also, we're very interested in being able to uh, mix the ecosystem, so so to provide access to public blockchain capabilities for uh, customers and devices on our permission chain. So so yeah, we're very very much doing it. We're very much pushing it forward. Um, and, and this is how we're seeing it. If you ask me personally, I believe that we're on a road to public chains. I believe it's like the internet where you had intranets and internet. I believe we will end up with public chains. I believe that some of the work that happened that's going on, especially uh, the work with uh, Ethereum, the recent merge, which, you know, from an energy point of view, started to make, uh, make, make it much more energy efficient. Uh, to be a part of it, but with things like EIP 1559, you know, w- which is another improvement proposal, we're going to start seeing up to 100,000 transactions per se- second on, on public blockchain. So I think the stress tests are there, and I think eventually uh, we will be on public chain, but the, the interim period is permission, public, and public permission. And these, you think these, like uh, for basically uh, order fulfillment, order processing, and, and uh, those, those will be, uh, be, be able to be done through the public blockchain? I, I think technically, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, yeah, the, sure, I, yeah. I, I, I think the barriers are more business, right? So it's all about yeah. because 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 fundamentally, what you have is yeah you know, is the decentralized world where your control point is not controlling your customers, uh, right. but 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 being first to market and having a great product. And right. and the current world we have, which is control points, controlling your customers, controlling access. Yeah. And, and and the problem for, or the, or the challenge for, for conventional business is how you evolve your business model to a decentralized model, right? How you make money with decentralized models. Exactly. I don't think that's been worked out yet, right? So I think yeah. it's worked out for the protocol, because the public blockchain charge a utility Gatsby yeah. and they're making money. But how you make money as a corporate where you bring mass ecosystem uh, yeah. to public blockchain it has not been worked out. And I don't think the conversation is there because, you know, for example, if, you know, Facebook were to bring, you know, 2 billion users to Ethereum, what do they get out of it? And I think exactly. these are some of the high level business incentives that need to be worked out. I, I think here, I, Mark, I would like you to talk about the super app because to me, it kind of looks like that you kind of crack it because it's all, you know, the layer is decentralized, um, yeah. you know, underneath yeah. is decentralized, but... Yeah. What actually is, because the focus is really on UX, UI, user experience, and right. at the moment you are switching between different kind of apps, where mm. this um, opportunity to have a super app that everything can be plugged in and build is basically building an infrastructure where is your one place to go where you can do all yeah. your business. So yeah, yeah. I, would, I would like you to expand on that. If, and if you think that is really the point where you can monetize exactly what, what David said, which is a big problem, and monetize on a decentralized yeah. dis- solution. Exactly. The monetize is a very important. And uh, we actually contacted a year ago from a major operator, a mobile operator, uh, that's uh, specifically for African market. And um, their idea was that uh, basically to allow people to use their network and have the app uh, for, in order to be able to send and receive money. Right? So... Uh, they provide the uh, video calling, instant messaging, group chats on that as well. And they would, they would also have uh, localized content for the users. And uh, one thing that they'd be actually tackling is, uh, you know, uh, we take for granted uh, WhatsApp. You just download it, you download another YouTube. And there's a lot of places that, uh, you know, the data is really expensive. They don't have contracts. 
the, the main point is that we're talking about 5G's and uh, you know IOTs and but the problem is that uh, you know they don't even have uh, some places a lot of the population don't have even 3G equivalent phones really the handsets that's the problem so for them to uh, for any person to da- be able to download all these apps is just ludicrous and um, they can't so they, they said well why don't we come up with an app <laughs> because they contact because you guys are the e-commerce telecom experts um, and they contacted me and said, do you, do you know anything about a super app? And I said, like, what, a WeChat, you know, <laughs> at that time? And then, uh, then it all kind of fit together. It's like, yeah, yes, we have the e-commerce, so we can provide that for you telecoms, right? So you can have your customers there. They could be doing all their online stuff. And uh, we, we can provide, which now is a super app. It's actually, you can do video calling, instant messaging, um, and all that group chatting in one app. And in, in essence, uh, you have a lot of third parties that are integrated, like micro apps, and you don't have to download hundreds of apps. That's the thing. And what we have is we have our own wallets now. So you actually, uh, we're going to be launching the EMG token. So you can actually use to earn concepts. So you, you're going to do transactions within the app, even for the telecom operator. So that, you know, they can go online and they can go uh, buy their uh, tariffs. They can do anything. And we have actually uh, an agreement with a 4G uh, equivalent Huawei uh, major distributor through for the African market specifically. So the phones are going to device is going to be like uh, 70 to even 80 percent reduced from the actual retail price so they can get the app and they can buy the phone you have the app already uh, installed and they will already have data from the, the the local provider so that that's a massive plus and then they can actually it's the first app that you can send and receive while we, we could have this conversation right now and Steph you could say send me some uh, USDT or EMG token and I get a receipt pop up and then I can send it right away to you. And while we do that transaction instantaneously, you'll get 5% of the EMG token back into your wallet. So you're kind of getting this used to it. So it's like an incentive. And again, the, the main thing is data, uh, the cost of it, uh, having the, you know, the devices. And uh, basically that, that old cliche is like connecting the unconnecting and banking the unbanked. I think that's that's uh, one way to you know that we can uh, that we're I think we're we're really solving and able to solve some of these problems. Yeah, I think is uh, is very interesting what you said. The most country in the world they don't have even 4G, right? And uh, you know when we th- when we think about there's been so much said about 5G and really there are not many use cases of 5G yet. Mm. Do you think the main use case of 5G will be within Web3? I mean, look, uh, 5G it's 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 a it's a new new you know it's a big big uh, you know Gartner everybody's writing about it um, sure it's it's wonderful have we seen the full effects of 5G to be honest no I don't think so um, the IoT is is something that's nothing new there's you know we, we uh, the telcos they tried to launch that big time um, it didn't quite work out as much so uh, what I think more is the 5G is like you know we can do use cases like for the marketplace the 5G IoT marketplace is something that's been really used for it within, uh, you know, maybe David knows more about this than me, but uh, I, um, I haven't seen that yet, that the 5G will be have such a massive effect within the blockchain yet. I'm sure there's good ideas for it, but one thing we're starting is, is, the, is a, a project in uh, one of our telecom companies in Europe, and we're doing uh, this 5G I- IoT marketplace for, for the, you know, the local um, uh, cities, basically. So we have three or four cities that are running on our CRM and being used uh, for the blockchain, um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of use cases. Is there any case studies though that that have you know these uh, these real life? I haven't I haven't yet uh, found any to be honest. But maybe David knows more. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree, Mark. Uh, five G is infrastructure, right? It, it, it's infrastructure, and if you look at a lot at, at a lot of where we're going, you know, critical for autonomous level four. So this is autonomous driving. And we saw in the UK um, uh, an announcement by Ford that they're going to start uh, not autonomous driving trials on UK roads. So, 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 so in terms of low latency communication, absolutely critical there. Um, if you look at um, what's happening with uh, the buzzword, the headline of 2023, which is generative AI and open AI, uh, which is built on that sort of technology stack. Yeah, I mean, if you want to have virtual assistance in cars and virtual assistance on the moves, uh, yeah. and you want automatic prompting and you want it to be real time, yeah, 5G is going to be a massive enabler of, uh, mm-hmm. of, of taking, um, you know, chat GPT, open AI, generative AI out of your laptop, right, and, and, and having it applied in real life uh, contextually. If we look at Web3, another aspect of Web3, 
I think you know for, for 5G to really play a role, you've got to combine it with the application. And the applications are using AI. They're using uh, other immersive technologies for the metaverse. Um, they, you know, they, they, you have uh, autonomous driving applications which may use some or all of these. And and I think when you when you when you look at that, yeah, you know, 5G will play a huge role. Uh, in the metaverse, because the the metaverse, you know, uh, is all about immersive uh, technologies, augmented realities, virtual reality, mixed reality. Uh, we're seeing Apple, um, you know, uh, touted to make an announcement uh, this year on 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 the release of its mixed reality headset. And um, you know, for the metaverse to sort of meet the the, the opportunity targets or, or forecasts out there, which is anywhere up to five trillion. 5 trillion US dollars, so roughly 5% of global GDP by 2030 or 2035, you know, it's going to be more than people playing games, right? It's going to have to be on the move. It's going to be in supply chains. You know, it's going to be integrated into mobile. It's going to be uh, in our everyday work. Now, when you start combining this with generative AI, and, and uh, you know, I've got this saying that uh, AI is, uh, 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 the metaverse is AI on Earth. There, there was a headline from, from someone in IBM and I think Goldman Sachs, and they were saying that, uh, you know, uh, open AI, generative AI could replace um, 300 million jobs, right? So what kind of jobs are these? These are white collar jobs, processing, uh, but sometimes these are jobs that interact with people. How's that going to happen? Well, you're going to need the metaverse. You're going to need them to interact with um, you know, a, a, a bot on steroids, some some sort of person or some sort of uh, immersive experience. So you start having metaverse combined with AI, um, maybe powered by uh, Web3 wallets, Web3 web self-sovereign digital identity, and these things come together in these apps. Will they need, and maybe these apps are now uh, being played out uh, on a car, right, autonomous car. Do you need uh, 5G and 5.5G for that? Yeah, absolutely. Is it there now? No, I don't think the infrastructure is rolled out fully, uh, and I don't think the applications are there. But is that where it's going? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's, it's amazing uh, the way you kind of describe all these components, and yeah, probably we are going to get there in the next decades. But uh, going back to another piece of uh, uh, Web3, which is the NFTs. So what are the use cases right now for NFT in telecommunication? I've got one. So there's uh, basically, the, the, we've got, we're actually working on a project with Polygon, because uh, we're, we're running on the Polygon network. And we, um, we have something with the uh, operator, which uh, we'll be doing the loyalty rewards. Through NFTs, through smart contracts. So you probably heard about the you know Polygon launching the Starbucks. I don't know if they call it the, the NFTs, if that's a, a allowed. You know, call it digital collectibles. I think that's a, that's the that's the word. That's a, but yeah. So so we're definitely uh, working with uh, one operator where we're doing a POC where we'll be launching um, the uh, loyalty rewards program through an NFT smart contracts. And uh, I mean, that, you know, that's uh, going to be one of the first in a, in a telco, which is amazing using blockchain. And uh, I don't want to go too much into detail about it, but uh, it's something that um, would really, I think, um, you know, catch some headlines. Uh, Starbucks is, is interesting. You, you remember how much headlines that caught and imagine one operator would be using that would be quite quite interesting and uh, I think this is what we need like just to go over and um, having maybe smaller adoption within the telcos uh, having some kind of a uh, you know a basic being that or, or using as, as a you know to, uh, for the in, uh, identity using smart contracts new customer authentication within telcos so again go, not having to go to a, you know to the store show your IDs and all this stuff than having to wait four days to have it online and then you find out your name is spelled wrong. Uh, really, you, you can really uh, you know, uh, do it seamlessly through, through smart contracts. So having these small, smaller steps in order to get mass adoption, I'm going a bit sideways here to answer your question, but it's, uh, it's something that's definitely a use case for this, 100%. Yeah. David, do you want to add anything about NFTs? Uh, no, no, I, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, NFTs are digital ownership. Right. So, so in telecoms, uh, you know, the use cases, y y yes, loyalty points related to collectibles you can own, good use case. You know, uh, ownership of uh, devices, ownership contracts can be yeah. uh, NFTs. 
And what we've got to understand is that, um, I mean, even your, your telecom plan could be an NFT where you're looking at the new developments uh, because there's two important, well, there's three components to an NFT. Right? I, I can describe them uh, in Ethereum language, smart contract language, right? So you've got a, a 721, which is the ownership of the asset outright. Uh, then you have uh, the recent, uh, there's two recent um, smart contracts in Ethereum language, but they, they, they run right through. One of them is the time-bound NFT, and, uh, and that smart contract allows you to add a time limit to the ownership. So that then starts fitting with leasing, rentals, um, time plans, uh, whatever, right? Uh, so that, that, that is really powerful and could, could potentially revolutionize uh, the way people access mobile contracts, you know, prepaid and postpaid. Uh, and sure. the minutes uh, in there, sure. and then the other one is the uh, is the royalties, right? So 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 the other thing is the, the NFTs is the royalties. So this is where, at the moment, someone who composes music or artwork uh, can have a royalty payment uh, in per per perpetuity wherever that uh, artwork is used or consumed yeah. or the music is streamed. Um, again, in telecoms, you know, that could be something where is we're developing applications, you know, etc. That the royalty could be part of it, right? So. So I think uh, absolutely agree with Mark for now. I, I think loyalty points, um, you know, ownership of devices, uh, you know, is, is one. But I think with these new developments in NFT, uh, it's, it's opening the way where anything can be an NFT. And actually, um, a lot of the things that are contractual now using traditional contract, contra contracts and agreements, which are quite cumbersome, can actually be handled with NFTs in the future. For sure. Now, before we kind of wrap it up, uh, uh, there is one point that I wanted to discuss a little bit more in details, which is digital identity. Because we discussed it earlier about, um, you know, SSI, about, you know, the importance that actually mobile tied up to an identity is. So my question would be, are telco companies looking as ident at identity as a service? Are they planning to capitalize still on data management or we are actually giving the data, which is what all the centralized movement is, the giving the date, the power, the, the ownership of the data back to the people and how that can actually look like within uh, the telecommunication industry? I think, uh, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll you know, again, try to be a little bit more pessimistic, but uh, from the high level, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, what's happened, what Signal did to the telecom. So, you know, uh, I, I remember back in the day, the, it's maybe still is, the data, data, you know, data roaming, data usage was, you know, even if I was studying in, uh, in uh, California and then, you know, calling or, or doing something, you know, uh, through the next state was massively expensive, you know, and um, people then just said, uh, started using WhatsApp for free, right? That you can call it, call and uh, use it for free. So what did that do? Did that mean that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, they're going to go full, full fledged, uh, not charge anybody, uh, the telcos? Of course not. But what they did come up with was unlimited data. So we need to compete, right? So we need to do something because we're losing a lot of customers. We're losing a lot of revenue to that side. So. What is a, de a decentralization of the data going to go to uh, just go like that uh, away from the from the telcos? I don't think so. But what it will force them to do is to adapt it somehow. So there'll be how should I say, like some happy in between. So I think it's really positive that we'll we'll get there. But uh, look, it, it's it'll, it'll benefit everybody. I think in the end. Um, but you know, to give up something that's again very precious to these uh, to these operators uh, is is uh, there needs to be some force you need to have a it's, it's something like with this uh you know mobile virtual network operations like um if you go to any country there's now many mobile virtual network operators is it something like the telco said oh we want to share some of our network and profits with the other uh competition why why should i right if i don't need to if you're forced to if there's regulations yes they, they will so uh, i think uh, there's a positive in the end that we we will be getting benefits from it. Um, maybe David can go, go a bit more in detail about it, but that's from, from uh, what I'm looking at it, there'll be a positive from this decentralization of the data, uh, but I don't think it will ever be like a full-fledged, you know, uh, you, you can control all your data and, and uh, we won't have any of it kind of thing, unfortunately. I don't know. Yeah, so, 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 so I agree totally, Mark. I, I, I think, uh, you know, self-sovereign digital identity is going to be the killer app uh, of Web3 and all the technologies coming together uh, that hasn't taken off yet for a number of reasons. Um, what, what is interesting is we start to see um, a couple of things, right? So we start to see 
uh, a push for wallets. So I believe we're moving towards a world of wallets. Mark, Mark, Mark mentioned it uh, earlier. I absolutely agree. The wallet will be the interface to the customer. And the for wallet sure. will be the, 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 the new OS that the customer uses to access services, right? Um, now, now, now what, what, what is driving the wallet, right? How are you going to, what, what, what is the single sign on to the wallet? It's going to be identity and digital identity and verifiable credentials. And it's interesting to see um, with the European Union, EI-2.0, um, you know, where they, they're, they're not mandating, uh, but they're stating, uh, you know, and declaring that they want to have a European, um, you know, identity wallet uh, for all European citizens, right, and organizations. And uh, we're actually working with them on the um, wallets for identities, uh, uh, wallets for devices, um, and the identities for devices. Now, I think the wallet, the drive to the wallets also is uh, uh, in the pri private sector. You're seeing banks move into the wallet business. Uh, one of the biggest uh, wallets in M3, uh, MetaMask, is owned by Consensus, which is owned by JP Morgan. And, and uh, you're seeing Apple Wallet, Apple using their wallet to start uh, launching pay now, buy now, pay later services, and in, indeed other financial services. So it becomes very important. Now, what role does the telcos have to play in this? Now, obviously, the wallet is on the phone. Um, the telcos are trusted. We have uh, authentication at the edge. Uh, so I think there is a role that we can play both in the move to wallets uh, and in the digital identity. Now, if you look at some of the things that are working in digital identity, so something called Mobile Connect is often used uh, where you access financial services and they can check your IP. Uh, they can check that the SIM in your phone has not been swapped. Uh, they can uh, check your KYC. Uh, credential, etc. So that's already been moved, and and it's very clear that uh, the carrier, uh, you know, for for checking credentials will be mobile, right? So I think that that's already something there. Now, 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 what will cause or lead to digital identity really taking off? Because at the moment, there's been a lot of people working in it. It's not taken off, right? It's it's the it's yeah. the killer app that hasn't taken off. I think the government will be one of them. I think the other one will be telcos. Uh, share with the sheer number of subscribers and the trust and the authentication and the fact we're already doing KYC. And I think that will be infrastructure that will be used by applications on Web 2 and Web 3 to take it forward. Now, the decentralized side of it just basically means that it changes the ownership from uh, fragmented ownership at the moment where uh, different platforms own your identity <laughs> or aspects of your identity and your data right. uh, to one where, where individuals own it. Now, who can control that better? I think maybe individuals. Uh, where does the model for verifiable credentials and uh, and, and issuers and, and and these things fit better? I think it's within the, in, in individuals. Now, how telcos adapt to individual control is is part of the business model change and part of the operating model change. Uh, but I absolutely think telcos will be at the forefront and the core of digital identity going forward. And just just uh, jumping on that, I mean, there's one one like a, maybe it's, it's just for a use case for the telcos, but um, you know, every every telecom operator they have a fraud a blacklist of, of uh, companies or people that they don't do business with for, every, for reasons which, what have you. So everyone has their own and then having us like decentralized, but when in essence, in quotes, decentralized where, where all the telcos could actually share that data and, and uh, maybe, maybe benefit from that as well. That, that could be something cool as well that for, uh, you know, having, and then maybe you're, you know, uh, signing up for it or contract for, uh, through our operator could be easier. And make uh, you know less less uh, maybe you wouldn't have you know that many issues as a customer consumer, but definitely that's a, that's one use case that I thought about as well that could be used too. Okay, very interesting. So telco become acting more as a verifier of uh, credentials, or maybe well they already are. They need to in order for you to sign up to uh, to Vodafone or anyone, uh, you you need to. Process, you need to pass the process, right? They they, they do some uh, credential checks on you, right? That's that's normal. Um, it's like going to a bank, right? Um, but uh, they have their local ones, and then they miss. You know, it's it's very difficult because you you might have just moved from a state and then going there. So it's to having one one that would be on the on the blockchain that could be shared amongst the telcos and automatically updated, and you know, through through the smart is is an amazing use case, I think. We're going forward, yeah. Well, exciting things uh, on the on uh, you know the happening. Anyway, what I what I wanted to kind of wrap it up is um, asking you what are you most excited about in your work? What you're doing that you're really excited? Maybe something that is going to be released soon or something you're working on or something that is uh, you know is in plan. Mark, maybe you start. What are you 
mostly excited about? Yeah, I'm just practical. Yeah, I mean, just practical. I've I've got some uh, friends, and uh, I've uh, in, uh, for example, in Nigeria, and I. We're launching there, and uh, we've the B2C version of the super app, and basically we're, uh, you know, I'm just getting feedback. Like uh, I'm able to now have employees, in essence, uh, working and doing some some uh, through through if it, through KOLs or doing some PR for me, and uh, basically I can se- send instantaneously. I can send the, uh, the the tokens to their wallet, pay them instantaneously, and they're like genuinely saying thank you. I wouldn't have. You don't know what you've changed, how you changed my life, and and um, otherwise I wouldn't have be able to have a bank account. How I mean, how would I send the money now like through uh, you know this uh, Western Union? It's it's you know it's fifteen percent. They take fifteen percent of that commission. You it, it's just ludicrous. So uh, that really in it genuinely gives me gives me pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think for me um, the digital asset broker platform that I co-founded in Vodafone, which is using uh, combining Web three. Uh, with with IoT uh, to have um, these uh, automatic uh, transactions between uh, IoT devices, um, you know, uh, you leveraging digital identity uh, is something I'm really excited about. So we're starting to um, uh, do a lot of stuff in uh, EV charging uh, and, and move into the mobility sector. Um, and I'm really excited about how that can change the landscape of IoT uh, to start bringing more monetization. Um, because uh, when, when devices have the ability to move across organization boundaries um, and to transact with each other, it's opening uh, a lot of new monetization models. Um, so, 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 so very excited about that. What stage are you with uh, this platform? So, so it's live. Um, so it was announced uh, uh, in February 2022. Uh, we're now rolling out uh, at more scale. So it was live in the UK. We're now going to start moving across Europe. Uh, we're now working with uh, a lot in the mobility sector uh, we're on, on real use cases. So EV charging is one of them, but we're extending that to what we call pay by car and sell through car. Um, and, and yeah, we're, we're excited. Supply chain and logistics is another use case that we're looking at, fleet spare capacity. Um, so, so we're excited about what this can do. Um, but, but the other excitement, so that's, that, that's the work excitement. The other real excitement I've got is with uh, generative AI. And uh, when you start linking that with the metaverse, you start linking that with, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of um, IoT and Web3, um, it's really powerful. And uh, I was looking at something over the weekend um, where generative AI and you've got this voice to, voice to video where you could sort of say, you know, all right, I want to, do, I want to do a 15-minute advert, and I want this character, and I want it to do this and that. And it actually generates, <laughs> it's starting to generate the uh, the, the the sort of uh, filming or, or the and video. Dave, is that and your application that you're working on? Or no, no, it's not our application. I'm just a fan. Uh, but okay, but I'm seeing the potential of this. Obviously, yeah. leveraging uh, uh, managed connect- connectivity. But I'm seeing this. Yeah. I'm seeing the yeah. you know the the link of this with with communications, 5G, Web3, IoT, yeah. um, Metaverse uh, as, uh, as going to be a game changer. It's, it's truly yeah. exciting. Well, we should, we so, should connect if there's any of those um, ones that you're working on can be fit, good fit for the super app, let, let me know so we can... Definitely, we definitely, Mark. Together. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, on the show. That was a great conversation and uh, I look forward to having you back soon. Thanks Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.